Now, the United States and the Taliban's torturous relationship has roots in the Reagan era, when the CIA funded Afghan guerrilla fighters, the Mujahideen, to resist Soviet occupation at the time. David Gergen served as an advisor to Presidents Nixon, Ford, Reagan and Clinton. His new book, Hearts Touched with Fire, details lessons on leadership from the past. And he joins Walter Isaacson to discuss why the torch must now be passed to the next generation. Thank you, Christian and David Gergen. Welcome to the show. Walter, it's good to be with you. It's an honor. Christian has been reporting from Afghanistan. So I wanted in our discussion of leadership, you've written a great book on leadership, to talk about the leadership failures you think happened in Afghanistan. Sure. Thank you, Walter, for asking that question, because if we're in danger of forgetting about Afghanistan as we've become so preoccupied with Ukraine. But Afghanistan it remains a serious problem for the United States and for the Biden administration. In my judgment, it was the turning point for Joe Biden as president. I think because there was such a high moral content to the question of, of how to get out of Afghanistan safely and to bring our Afghanistan allies with us. Uh, and given that moral quality of the equation, uh, to leave people behind uh, was was a real dereliction of duty, and, and, it's been, and if you look at the mil how the military views things, you don't leave people behind. You know, you know, you're all you're all one unit, and so I think the failure came first and foremost from a lack of planning and a lack of sort of you know trying to figure out what might happen. You know, Napoleon uh, famously, before any battle, would figure out five or six ways it might unfold, so he could go lickety split to wherever the problem was and fix it very quickly. And here we weren't prepared like that at all. We had a plan which didn't work and we had no plan B as far as I can tell, at least not one that kicked in quickly. But to leave all those allies of the United States, people who were interpreters, people who put their own lives on the line to work with Americans in the hope that it would bring democracy to Afghanistan, to leave them behind was, it was such a, a disappointment. And uh, I think really ought to remain one of the classics uh, case studies that you study at a place like West Point, but very importantly, also study in business schools and public policy schools and elsewhere about what the responsibilities of leadership are. You know, you talk in Hearts Touched by Fire with the importance of having a true north, a moral compass. Do you think that uh, this was a moral uh, failure, but it was a practical need to get us out of Afghanistan? Well, we, I think getting out of Afghanistan as a proper general proposition was not unwise. There were many reasons why it would be good to get out of Afghanistan. And, they, and, and Biden made it clear he wanted to do that. Um, but I think it's how you do it that becomes all important. It's, uh, ideas are plentiful. The execution of ideas is really hard. And I think when they, they, didn't, they didn't appreciate what was coming, they closed down that air, the other airport which you know, really sh uh, shut down the number of people who could get out safely. And we had chaos uh, and people being trampled under the, uh, to the ground by what was happening at the lone airport we did have. So, so all of that get together, especially the fact that there are families now is still in Afghanistan who are still in hiding and the Taliban is, is shredding its various promises to be respectful. You know, it's just, it's cracking down quietly and they're getting away with it because the world's not paying a hell of a lot of attention. The people around Joe Biden, you know, are very expert in foreign policy. They've they been are. on the Senate staff. But it's not a team like Lincoln had, according to Doris Kearns Goodwin, of a team of rivals who had been principals. Do you think yeah. that's a problem of leadership? Yes, I do. I, I, do. I think you needed more conflicting voices. You know, it, it, um, it helped a lot uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis um, that, that President Kennedy had uh, voices inside who could disagree. You know, we, we moved from the first solution to, to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We had a unanimous view of basically to bomb out of the, out of the shadows. Uh, we moved to a quarantine because people began to question that first view. And among the people who questioned it the most were people who were very close and really understood, understood Khrushchev. Uh, and I think that we simply don't have, we have people who are experts but they haven't done the big league kind of negotiations for the most part. We were greatly aided in the past by people of the stature or near stature of a Kissinger, of a George Schultz, of a Jim Baker, you know, of Condi Rice, of Madeleine Albright. Um, I, I think those people were, uh, were, were 
given more uh, respect but simply because they've been there and been playing in the big leagues and sort of uh, become masters of the game, so to speak. In your book, you talk about how a great leader needs to look at one big thing. You mentioned you know, how each president has done that well. Well, the yeah. one big thing that Biden said during his campaign that he was going to do is bring us back together. And he yeah. seemed uniquely qualified to do so as somebody who had worked across the aisle so much. And instead of doing a laser-like focus on ending some of the poison and divisions in our society, he ended up uh, pushing a whole lot of different things. Yeah. Some would say he even moved too far to the left. What do yeah. you think? Well, I think, you know, I, I, you can't blame Biden for having a, you know, a, a, a left in a Democratic Party. That's, that's been sort of traditional. I do think that he would have been better served had he had he had this focus on, on uh, bipartisanship and, and done and taken various steps. I, you know, early on, I think it would have been wise to start using Camp David to bring people to there who were of different views and beginning to work with the leadership on the other side of the aisle uh, and, and to make some concessions early on to Republicans in exchange for um, some concessions on the part of the Republicans to, to do things that both sides could agree on. There were a few things they could. And I, I think it. I think it got away from him because he started do, trying to do so many things, and he was being pummeled from so many different angles. It, it appeared that if you were watching closely, he was changing his policies to fit the people who came after him and put pressure on him. And and that is never a wise policy because it just invites more pressure from different groups and a lot of a lot of resentments. What I hear from friends who are in in the administration is that that, that what. What Biden ultimately did was bring a lot of people in from Senate office staffs. And so you had people who were masters of, of the Hill, but it never really worked in the executive branch in, as, in the same way, or not, not very many had. Uh, and that, that lack of, uh, of years at that level is, is, a, is a problem. Now, I, I would point to one of my mentors in life, Jim Baker. I thought as chief of staff to Reagan, he had it about right. He really helped Reagan. Bring, have an assortment of people across the board so that uh, Reagan was able to resist the pressures from the right and indeed had a relationship with Nancy Reagan. I mean, between Kay Graham and Nancy Reagan that uh, really helped him uh, in, in the governing process. Uh, and you don't see any of that today. It's, uh, you know, there was a time when Kay Graham could, could invite people to her house and no matter who they were, no matter their backgrounds, they would all show up. And that you knew if you went to Kay Graham, there were going to be people, be people there who were not like you, who disagreed with you. But they, they came because out of a sense of there was a higher loyalty here. You talk about the need for experienced elder statesmen to be running yeah. things. And yet the theme of your book in some ways is how we really have to pass the torch now to a new yeah. generation. There have been older people clinging to power too long. Oh, I, uh, yes. And I'm glad you brought that up. The, uh, it, there's no question in my mind that we're on an unsustainable path here in, in the United States, uh, and we need to change. We need to change directions. And, but I think that the people who are most qualified to change direction over time are not the people who are in power today. You know, I I, I think as time goes on and people get older, I think they have a responsibility to, to step back. Uh, and from my point of view, I just turned 80, for example, and I can just say, I, I can just see you 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 lose some of your focus, you lose some of your memory, your brain. It doesn't operate in quite the same way. You're a little, you become very fearful of falling. There are a lot of things that begin to happen to you in your 80s, and it, and indeed in your 70s. That I think the leaders who are in charge today, uh, they're we we shouldn't be ruled by octogenarians going forward. The, the United States is facing is a hugely powerful country. Which we face very, very complex problems. We need fresh energy. We need fresh ideas. We need fresh blood. And I think the earlier that we pass the torch to the younger generation, that would include Generation X, by the way, who been the people have been waiting and on the sidelines uh, somewhat impatiently recently, as they should be. Uh, but I think they need to turn it back. What I would suggest is. Have you know? Have one or two older people around. You need somebody in the mix, some gray hair person, in the in the mix. You don't necessarily need them running people, running things, but you need to create a mix of people. Reagan was a, a prime example of that. He brought a lot of people in from California, but as you know, he got a whole group of people called the Pragmatists, led by Jim Baker, to um, 
to, to be there with him and to bring voices of experience. Uh, and, and so Reagan had a nice mix and contrast that with presidents who just brought their buddies. It doesn't work very well just to bring your buddies. And when you look at the people leading in the House and the Senate, even you look at Mitch McConnell, yep. you know, you look at Diane Feinstein, who is uh, staying on, even though she's in her late 80s. Uh, and you could look at Nancy Pelosi in the House. You said that it's a problem having a country run by people pushing 80. Do you think Joe Biden should not run again? I think he ought to be leaning toward not running, just as Donald Trump should be leaning toward not running. Uh, I, th I think it's for the, I think the country needs time to you know, to think this through. But as a general proposition, I would come down on the side of saying, Mr. President, you've done some great things in life. Uh, it's time to um, it, it, time has moved on. We need your continuing advice. We need your counsel. We need your. We'd like to introduce some special diplomatic missions for us. Um, but I but the time has come to respectfully. Uh, for to pass the torch. And I think that same thing obviously clearly ought to apply on the re Republican side with Donald Trump. Um, and then, but there are other people who are octogenarians too in the Senate. We still have, we don't have enough voices of the young, the young yet in the House and the Senate. I think they're, the, the encouraging thing, Walter, and I tried to say in the book is I'm a short term pessimist. I think the next few years are going to be rough, but I've increasingly become a long term optimist. Because I do see people, young people coming up now, especially the, the veterans coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. I think they make great leaders. But there's another set of people not less talked about, and that is people of color, especially black women. They, they have become moral standard bearers in the country uh, on, on issues of equity. Uh, and, I, and I'm glad they've stepped forward. With, you know, I don't share their politics, usually the left of me, but I celebrate the fact that they've gotten into the arena and are pushing for change. We need more change agents among the young. They can really be helpful over the long term and, and, and integrating this society and weaving us back together. Well, your book begins, I think, with Greta Thunberg, with the kids from Parkland High School, where there was the shooting. What do you think is different for this new generation uh, seeped in social media for how they're going to lead? Well, social media, for starters, um, we, we've learned that on one hand, social media can be a way to use as a springboard to, to prominence and to uh, stardom. You know, look at AOC and, you know, coming out of a bar and running for Congress and having a national voice and having an important voice in our national discourse. Uh, she just came, came out of nowhere. That You could never have done that in, in an earlier time. On the other hand, we also know it's a double-edged sword, like most in, most innovation, and you're the you're the expert on innovation. But so so often, uh, you know, it's used for setting up disinformation campaigns. We don't even know who's paying whom to, to get these put these lies into our into our mainstream. Well, what we do know is that the, is that people are buying into the lies at a surprisingly high high rate. Uh, so that I think one of the reasons Biden has had difficulty to, uh, governing. As he started out with 30 or 40 percent of the of the country believing he was an illegitimate president, that's that's a that's a very weak foundation on which to, to build a robust presidency. The world is moving so quickly today that I think it's one of the most important qualities of a new leader today is adaptability. How can, how do you and that sort of goes to the Afghanistan Afghanistan point? How do you adapt quickly to a very cha quickly changing environment? That is a, that's a that's a key. Uh, question that, that comes up again and again. For 40 years, David, you have been sort of a symbol of rising above partisanship, working for both Democratic and Republican presidents. Why has the partisanship become so polarized, so bitter today? I will be asking that question for a long time, won't we? Um, the, uh, it, it is partly, so the social media has a, has a role in this. I think, Walter, it, it, was, it was a swing of the pendulum. After we, we had the, coming out of World War II, there was so much pride in the country and so much a sense that America is very special. American exceptionalism became a, a huge sort of underlying thesis of, our, of who we were and what we were trying to accomplish. And, and, the, and the range passed fairly quickly uh, after the Eisenhower, Truman Eisenhower years, the range passed to a new generation, the World War II generation. And from Kennedy through George Bush Sr., we had seven presidents. Every one of those presidents served in the uniform. Every one of those presidents was in World War II in one way or another. Uh, 
And it really influenced them when they came out. And I think they have a different sense of what, of what the country can be. Uh, I think, I think that the, the, the baby boom population, generally speaking, has been split since early childhood. The Vietnam War split us down the middle. It was just an ax right down the middle of our generation. It's never been, we've never put it back together. Uh, your book is called Hearts Touched by Fire. Why did you choose that title? Well, you're, 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 you're such a good historian, you'll understand this. Um, but I, I'm, one of my, you know, I went to law school, and one of the people who was sort of a hero in law school in those days uh, was Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. He was a distinguished jurist in the Supreme Court from Teddy Roosevelt on through uh, uh, FDR. Um, but anyway, when he was young, he was 23 years old, uh, Lincoln issued a call for volunteers uh, for the for this, the first call for the Civil War. And Holmes could have ducked. You know, family, a lot of rich families, uh, the, the, the son was able to duck. Uh, and, and, and Holmes came from a prominent family, could have ducked, but he decided not to. He volunteered. He went into battle. He was grievously injured on three different occasions, left for dead on the third, uh, left, left for dead on the battlefield. And it was a miracle that he recovered. So, but 20 years later, he gave a speech, Memorial Day speech, at the, reflecting on his generation and what they got from service in World War and in the Civil War. And he spoke proudly and happily and as, as if it was a great experience. He said, people should live with in the passions of their time. That's what, that's what makes life rich and make you can make a difference. And he said, and he was talking about his generation. He said, we were fortunate. We were fortunate to be called at an early age to serve our country. And our hearts were touched by fire. And the, the, I, I think that leadership is ultimately about service. Uh, and servant leadership has you know, now become a popularized view of, of what, what kind of leaders we ought to be creating. And I think that's right. But I, but I do go to the point that if you want to live a life uh, that's a rich life and look back upon it and you have you can be proud of what you've done there's no better way to do that than to begin by serving your community when you're young if you do that i can guarantee you you'll be you'll get the bug most of you and you'll want to come back and do it again and again i the people i know who have thrived on public service have been among the happiest people uh, i've ever known david gergen thank you so much for joining us walter it's such a treat to be with you thank you